Fasten your seat belts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Live from Las Vegas, it's time for you to be Talking Movies with America's most award-winning film critic, John Barber. You're being, John, you're being so gentle. I've heard you give reviews and you're so rough, you're saying. <laughs> How would you have evaluated your own work uh, in some of the films that you did prior to, uh, <laughs> prior to The Longest Shot? I mean, Much like better than you, my friend. <laughs> Our next guest is one of those rare talents who has something to say and can say it funny. He's a writer-performer on the new Laugh-In and one of the most popular, outspoken, and entertaining personalities on the local news here in Los Angeles. He's won a half a dozen Emmys as a film critic and host of his own shows. Let's welcome Mr. John Barber, right over there. Welcome to Talking Movies, show number... Six. Doug, how are you today? I'm doing really well. Thank you, John. How did your meeting go? You were having an important meeting today. How did it go? Actually, it went very well. Well, uh, lady I, was a wonderful surprise. Well, I also understand that your bowling is going well, but I wish you'd do me a favor because a couple of times I wanted you, you, I wanted you to do something else and you went bowling and I know you need the exercise, but a lot of people want to hear you singing. Okay. So I know there must be a karaoke place somewhere near where you are. So maybe one night you could go in and give us a minute or two so that we could hear it. And especially my wife who is a professional singer. She said, you have a great speaking voice. I hope his singing voice is as good. So there you go. Why, thank you. I will look into that. And if I do get to a karaoke bar and I can, they have a tape deck and they can tape it, I'll tell them to do so. Well, thank you so much. People will appreciate it, especially your host and friend, Ma. And I know that you, you, you like singers, obviously, because you're one yourself. But I must tell you, you're going to hear at the end of this interview one of the most surprisingly amazing magical voices that you have ever, ever heard. He never started out to be a singer. It all came about by accident, but he has sold nearly well over 65 to 75 million albums, and he has appeared in 70 films, believe it or not, and starred on Broadway. He is an absolute filet mignon of talent, but he calls himself Meatloaf. And here he is, Meatloaf. Meatloaf, 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 I am so honored and humbled to okay. be talking. Thank you, John. So listen. Yes. Just call me Meat. I've been called Meat since I was two weeks old. Oh, my gosh, because I was going to say that, you know, you've probably heard this a lot, but because of someone of your stature, your monumental talents and success, I feel very, very uncomfortable even calling you Meat. I mean, truthfully, what do your family and friends call you? Do they call you Michael or M or America's Got Talent? Or is it just meat? Me. Oh, well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And everybody I'm, but my my everybody but my mother-in-law. <laughs> what does your mother-in-law call you? Michael. Really? Yeah. Oh, and Actually, she's the only she's the only person in the world right now. I've even got two IRS agents that call me meat. Oh my gosh, Almighty! Well, and then I can't tell you how indeed uh, honored I am to ha have you here. And I must tell you that if we all had 
one penny for every one of the albums that you have sold, we would all be rich and retired by well, right now. John, and, tell you the truth, I would love to have one penny for all the albums I've sold. <laughs> No, you're laughing. I haven't been. I I haven't been paid. The are only you? the only records I've been paid on are Rocky Horror Picture Show, the cast album, and then the movie, and um, um, oh, that cartoon show. Um, I did it with uh, Isaac Hayes. I did a song with Isaac Hayes for South Park, and uh, we were, oh, I get paid for that. Oh my gosh! You know, I used to hear the horror stories of that happening to black rock and roll artists during the 50s and 60s. But I can't imagine that it would be happening to somebody like you. I mean, you're, you sold 65 million albums. I've sold 100 million. Okay, 100 million. You've done like 70 movies for crying out loud. So uh, if there is something wrong that you aren't as rich as Paul McCartney right now so but you know what okay I'm, I'm gonna start with a very unusual question and it may not be that unusual because here you are one of the world's most famous vegetarians with the nickname meatloaf but i've got to ask you this question and you'll understand the point of it when i get to it and the question is this uh meat what are your thoughts on the Star Spangled Banner as a national anthem as opposed to America the Beautiful or God Bless America? Because you're an extremely talented singer, you're an extremely talented musician, and you've sung it. And um, so I have a point for asking this question. So your thoughts on it? Well, I, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but go on YouTube and watch me singing the national anthem at the Pittsburgh All-Star Game. Well, that's it. That's what, you know what? That's what I'm bringing up. I must tell you, I am not necessarily a fan of the song because it's difficult to sing. It talks about America's birth. It doesn't talk necessarily about America, what America has begun, uh, become. Have you ever seen... Sinatra sing the house I live in? Um, no, I don't well, remember. Okay, well, this uh, you're going to be thrilled by this. In the middle 50s, at the height of the blacklisting, there was an eight-minute Academy Award winning film written by Albert Maltz, a blacklisted writer, in which Frank Sinatra sings a song, The House I Live In, That's America to Me, which I feel should be the national anthem. Now, I heard what you're talking about. It was on TikTok. It was on YouTube. I've listened to it a dozen times, even though I've done enormous research on you. I'm an enormous fan of yours. I remember you from the Rocky Horror Picture Show and uh, the, the Fight Club. So we're going to get into that a little later, too. A lot of people have thought and a lot of critics have thought that Ray Charles did by far the most inspired version of the national anthem. Now, indeed, it's thrilling. I'm going to say this about yours. No one comes close to the magnificence of the power and the beauty of your voice singing that song at a ball game. And to me, it was Pavarotti without lyrics. <laughs> well, I, it, it's, it, it's a very good rendition. I've, I've sung the national anthem at Camden Yard, uh, at the Brave Stadium, Cleveland, uh, the New York Yankees twice. The second time I forgot the lyrics in, in <laughs> two lines and I went, nah, I did a, um, a um, oh, I can't remember now who used to go could have been Sinatra who would, would uh, know us being Crosby. And he would, he would if he forgot a lady, he would just go da 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 dum and put a da da in there. And I did for about a line and a half. And everybody kept going, oh, that was fantastic. So I thought, oh, God, nobody noticed. And then some guy I'm walking down past the concession stands going, um, 
going up to the seats and some guy screamed, way to go, loaf. You screwed <laughs> up the end. So, um, well, you know what I'm going to do with the, I was so inspired by it that what I'm going to do at the conclusion of this interview, I am going to play the, the YouTube of you doing that rendition. Again, nobody comes close to it. I mean, it's almost spiritual. It's so good. And then I'm going to follow that for you so that you and others can see Sinatra singing The House I Live In, which really represents this country. And even though me, people are going to be at home watching on a television screen, I guarantee you after they see you two superb artists doing these two songs, they're going to stand up and put their hands over their hearts. Now, there is no question in well, my they, they should, John. Well, there is, yes, you're absolutely right about that. Listen, I forgot, I fought for 30 years to become a citizen of this country and wasn't successful until 1977 after being deported twice and got my citizenship papers from Senator John Tunney. But your life story is so rich and so varied, it truthfully could not fit into a three hour movie it would have to be a mini series. So let's get back to the beginning. When you were first called Meat, where were you born? What were your parents like? Uh, what were your good or bad influences from your mother and father? Was it your mother or father who was musical or did you discover that accidentally by yourself? Okay, that's a long, you got, that's a lot of answer. Okay, uh, my father, was um, I do stand up comedy and from time to time I do the, I play my father, I play the character. He didn't talk like this, I just have a character. My son looks like nine and a half pounds of ground chuck. <laughs> I want you nurses, now you listen here. I want you nurses to make up a sign and on that sign it's gonna say mate in big black bold letter. So when everybody comes up to see Mary and Sue and Billy and Bob, they say mate. And he was a Dallas policeman and I have the nurse go, we can't do that. And he goes, you got to, I'm a Dallas policeman on and on and on. And I have another nurse get, and I do all three characters. But anyway, I don't know that that's what happened, but he was a Dallas policeman at the time. And he got them to put meat on the front of my little crib in the nursery. And um, not sure how I had a picture of it that got, that got thrown out uh, 1981, not by me, but in a, in a horror story. So anyway, um, my mother was probably one of the smartest human beings you will have ever met. She graduated magna cum laude. She wrote a book about communism for the Dallas public school system, not about the politics of communism, but about what communism did to the people of Russia. Wow. Citizens. And that's did, what- Did your mother about. and father get along? Because I have the impression- I don't know. Uh, uh, okay. Well, I had, uh, there, uh, you know what? You may not know this. You obviously don't know it. I, I have to tell you, there are a couple of things about you which I identify with enormously. First of all, uh, I don't drink at all because my mother was an alcoholic and my father had deserted us in 1939. To, he thought it would be easier to go and fight the Germans than to fight my mother. So that's why I don't drink. She used to bring uncles home like they were grapes, came in bunches to bed with her and board with her. And so I was on the streets when I was six. Now I, I read, that once in a while you and your mother would go out looking for your father in bars. Is that true? That's true. And I, and to today, I, I think that's where I learned how to act because I was big and I weighed 240 pounds in the seventh grade. So I would go out and she wouldn't go and I wouldn't let her go in. And I would go into these really, oh, uh, between Dallas and Fort Worth, along the Trinity River, in the in the fifties, and and 
early 60s were some of the worst bars that you can possibly imagine. And I would go in and basically look around the room and people would, ever, it would get quiet when I walk in and I'd look at them like, if you touch me, you're going to die. Oh. That's, that was, and that's what I was thinking. So <laughs> that's the character I took. That's why I'm really good as a serial killer. I, <laughs> or, you know, but I took that character and I would pull my dad out and some guy sitting next to him would go, hey, kid, go. And I remember slapping two different people, two grown men who grabbed my shoulder and I just, I didn't punch him. I just backhanded him. How and old were you? 12, maybe 13. Oh my goodness gracious. And um, I think when I first started going, I was about 11. And I just, I no. And I would drag him out. And well, then, what, what, I mean, what, when did you, uh, at 12, at some time around that time, you must have realized that you had either this voice or this interest in music. Now, when you were younger, Ed, were you a fan of singers? Uh, what And what singers did you admire? And when you went to the movies, since you ended up in so many movies, were there any movie actors that you admired? And did you want to be any one of them? No, I wanted to be Bob Lilly, defensive tackle for the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> I had no interest in anything but football. That's oh my god. That's all I cared about. Now I'm going to I'm going to give you a quick little story here. When we would ride around in the car, my well, I loved Elvis, but I didn't know that much about him. Tennessee Ernie Ford. Oh yes, yeah. sixteen tons. Song called Sixteen Tons. Yes, and that was my favorite song when I was a kid, and I used to try to sing it to the radio. My mother would turn down the radio and tell me, and I remember hearing this. We were, the, the time that I remember the most is we were on Lover's Lane. Across, uh, to the left of us was Love Field. And she turned it down and said, it's a good thing you're not going to be a singer because you can't carry a tune in a bucket. Oh, my gosh. But that's not true. Well, now you want to know when I, okay. <laughs> now, I had no desire to do anything but play football. That was everything led that way. And I got hit in the head with, in the ninth grade, we used to go, we threw eight pound shots in junior high. Oh, that was me. We threw eight. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Oh, I can't hear you. Never mind. Uh, we threw eight pound shots in the ninth grade, but in the we went over to the high school and the state champion that was in high school came out. They were supposed to be warming up. He threw the shot and put 62 feet and hit me right here in the head. Oh my God. And um, <laughs> it was after that, that I could sing, but it was not for months that I figured that out. Oh my God. That's amazing. I couldn't sing before that. Have and, you ever heard of a psychic by the name of Peter Herkos? Peter Herkos was the world's most famous psychic in the 50s and the 60s. And he was on the top of his house in Sweden fixing something. And he fell 16 years of age and hit his head. And that's when he became this proven psychic. And something must have happened that all of a sudden you could carry a tune. And, you know, there's a moment in your life where I, I identified very, very strongly with you again, when your mother passed away, she evidently had had such an influence on you that you went into seclusion. When you were in seclusion, what is it you were thinking about and what brought you out of it? Wow, the way you asked that question, I've got, I'm, got tears in my eyes right now because of my mother, you hit my mother right on. Um, 
my mother had cancer from the time I was about 11 or 12. And I think that's why I, I'm, I don't, okay, this is going to be weird. I cannot picture in my mind the faces of my mother or my father. My father a little better than my mother. My mother, not at all. And she was dying of cancer. I'd gone, she'd made me go to summer school because I wanted to play football and I'd lost all my scholarships because I got hurt in my senior year in football. So I wanted to walk on at Texas Tech. And they, the head coach, J.D. King, said, yes, please. And, and then I, I got hurt really bad in about the seventh week of, of that summer session going into the fall. And um, I, I had completed the first half of my freshman year going to summer. So I completed the freshman year, went to North Texas State. And the beginning then, and I went to summer school, the beginning of my junior year, which was the fall of 67. Uh, no, it was the fall of 66, sorry. Um, I talked to my mother. No, it, I'm sorry, my dates are confused, but it was 67, but it was in the, in the winter of 67. And I went to see her and they'd moved her to a hospice. I had no idea what that was. And I went into the room and she was in plastic. They oh. had in a big plastic tent. And my mother was a big woman, 100, 140 and once weighed 200, but lost weight. So she was big. She probably weighed 80 pounds. Oh, she looked wow. like a skeleton. I freaked out, went to my house, stole my dad's credit card, and went to Love Field. The girl that turned around was my prom date, Paulette Farrar. And I said to her, I want to go on the next flight that you have. And it was Brandon Fairways, which no longer exists. Mm -hmm. And it was to LA. And from that point on well plus getting hit with the shot put and doing wind up doing musicals getting kicked off the football team because <laughs> it's a big my my life is like some carnival where you walk down and you go behind this tent and that tent and the painted lady and the fat guy and the gun it's it is a so bizarre. Well, and you know, it's it's like a bunch of accidents that set you off somehow in a predetermined destiny. Okay, and then so it was predetermined, but then you had to then you had to be opened to allow that predetermination. Okay, but you, you mentioned the business of doing musicals. Okay, uh, the, the couple of things I want to ask you, the, you never quite answered. You went into seclusion. I want to know what you were thinking about while you were in seclusion, having lost your mother. And did a friend bring you out of it or did you come out of it on your own? No, I didn't come out of it. And I don't, I can't tell you what, well, I can, yes, I can. Um, my father, three days, four days after my mother's funeral. And I don't remember my mother's funeral. And people have told me, you don't want to know what happened. So I've just left it alone. Um, my father tried to kill me. Oh my God. And I was fighting for my life. And it's the only time that I ever overtook him. He was big. I mean, he was six, three and 320 pounds or something like that. And I, at that point, weighed <clears throat> 275. So I was big, but apparently I broke his ribs. Oh my gosh. And I left the house in a pair of gym shorts and a high school uh, kind of jersey thing you wore under the shoulder pads and walked barefooted over to the same guy that found me, Billy Slocum. He's still my friend today. That's magnificent. Now, aside, okay, the next, I have two questions. 
One is there had to be a time when then you had to start singing, realizing you had this either the talent or the desire to do this. Did you sing because you had to, because you wanted to be famous or you wanted to be rich or because now the other thing is since okay, Bob, I wanted to get I started to sing because I wanted to get out of study hall. <laughs> okay, then that's great. So now tragedy really struck your family, but you were in doubt. If we are approaching the 58th anniversary of the murder of John F. Kennedy, you would have been around 13 years of age in 1963, November 22nd. So not only had tragedy sort of struck your house, they struck the country and struck the city. Tell me about that day for you. Oh boy, you ready? Okay. All right. I had a hardship driver's license because where we lived, we lived at that time in Farmers, Farmers Branch, Texas, and they had no school buses to get me to high school. And that was my sophomore year. And I, my mother started me early in school because I was so big. So they let us all out of school that day. All you had to do was bring a note that said you can go to Love Field. And so three of us went to Love Field. Billy Slocum was one, a guy named Jimmy McWhorter and me. And Jimmy McWhorter's father worked at Love Field. When we got there, it was so crowded, we couldn't get anywhere. We saw the plane land, saw him sort of come down that gangway kind of thing, the steps, and we couldn't see anything. So Jimmy said, my father said, they're going to bring him out of this gate. We go, well, we doubt it, but let's go. So we went there. There were three policemen, maybe six other people. We showed up. And Billy, who was the, who was voted best looking captain football team, uh, most likely to succeed. He was Mr. Everything in high school. We went to the gate. And John F. Kennedy's car came through that gate. Wow. And I was within 15 feet of him. And Jimmy, uh, not Jimmy, but Billy, because he was that guy, went over and shook his hand. Wow. And then, and it was an open top. He came through the convertible was down and we got all excited and because Billy and Jimmy's parents were wealthy. They had invested money in a Kingsman concert at Market Hall. They helped put up some money. And so they knew the guys at Market Hall. So that's where we were going. So we left Love Field, went to Mickey Mantle's bowling alley to the entrance. We wanted to get lunch. So we went to Mickey Mantle's and we went in the interest that we knew and got there. And it was weird because the, the doors that down the steps were gone. And there was a switchboard operator stand sitting there. And all of a sudden she said, the president's been shot. And one of the other guys, I didn't say anything at that time. I just drove him. And one of the other guys said, no. And she goes, yes. And they went and heard it on the radio and said, it's true. We went running through the parking lot, screaming, the president's been shot. And people were screaming at us, you kids, stop that. We got in my car and said, where are they going? Parkland Hospital. Because wow. that's where they that's where they would have gone. And we started on our way to Parkland Hospital. We were, these guys were, one of them, Jimmy was 15, Billy was 14. I think I was 14, maybe at that point, November 63. And, and some guy on the Stimmons Freeway, we were going towards Parkland, was jumping from lane to lane, waving his arms. And I kept slowing down, slowing down. Finally, I stopped. He put up a badge on my window. And to this day, Billy and I think he said Secret Service. They've wow. said no secret service were outside of around Kennedy or at the hospital. And he said, Pull, scoot over. I'm taking your car. I did. We drove into Parkland Hospital. There were snipers on the ground. 
There were snipers on the top of the building. And we pulled in and parked the car. And he said to us, do not move. I mean, he was serious. And we got there before the limo. Wow. Before John F. Kennedy's car. I did not see him come out of the car. We saw Jackie stand up. We saw John Conley stand up. Then Conley went down. We didn't know. He got on a stretcher. We didn't know that then. And I didn't move. I didn't scoot over from back into the driver's seat for 20 minutes. We were so scared. Finally, we just, Billy and these guys who were so just like, come on. And it, they said, let's get out of the car. So we did. Today's world, you couldn't get within 50. 1,500 yards of that limousine. We walked over and looked inside that limousine. Oh, my goodness. There was blood everywhere. And I guess there was other things, but we didn't, I didn't know what it was. But it was, and there was a rose or two on the floor, and it was, it was uncanny. And then we went back over and stood in line. Well, not stood in line, but stood outside Parkland. We were standing outside Parkland when they came out and announced that he had died. Oh, gosh. And we wanted to go because we had football practice. They would not let us leave. And nobody believed us that day until nobody believed us. The coaches just, we finally showed up at practice almost an hour late. And they said, where were you? And we told them, they said, you kids do not lie like that. And we just shut up because we weren't. I went home and I, I remember telling my mother and she goes, okay, yeah. And she didn't call me a liar. She just dismissed me. And then all of a sudden, my father was sitting there in his chair. I was sitting on the couch and Billy, Jimmy and myself came on TV. <laughs> and said, Here's three teenagers from Dallas talking to the senator from Illinois. Oh, my goodness gracious. And everybody saw it. After that, they believed us, didn't they? Me. Now, okay, I'm going to freeze this for a second. Oh, I'm no. gonna, okay, I'm going to fast forward for about 40 or 50 years, and I'm going to rewind. Now, the 40 or 50 years go by, and this guy, this meat who had all these problems, all of a sudden is friends with Bill Clinton, entertaining Bill Clinton, <laughs> friends with George Bush. Well, I wasn't was, friends with Bush. Was there, uh, I'm, not, not, I'm, not, I'm not friends with Bush. I am, I don't. You I appeared as a, I, Bill I, think, I guess it's friends with Bill Clinton, but yeah. not friends with George Bush. Um, okay, so let's just say Clinton. <laughs> One president's enough, okay? And, Here you and, are, this kid. From and the Carter. <laughs> okay, what what did you think when all of a sudden you thought, I am next to the president of the United States and he likes me? Uh, well, we were playing the inaugural, the number one inaugural, the National Armory, and Al Gore and Tipa Gore came in, and we played the song "Paradise by the Dashboard Light" early because I. I didn't want to play it when Tipa Gore was there because she was promoting yeah. get this stuff off the radio. Yeah, yeah. And the minute she shows up, I introduce myself. We introduce the band. They're really friendly. And she says to me, did you play Paradise yet? I went, <laughs> what? And she goes, that's my favorite song. I said, are you kidding? I mean, I'm, I don't know if I said, are you kidding? But I guarantee I thought it. And I said, yes. And she goes, we play it again. And so I went to the audience and I said, um, I think I said Al Gore's wife. I don't, that, I don't know. Uh, or maybe if I, I don't know what I said, but I said, basically, Tipper wants to hear it again. Is it okay with you? And everybody screamed, yeah. So Al was dancing with my background singer, Patty. I was dancing around with Tipper and we were all singing the song, Paradise by the Dashboard Light. And they, she knew it, every word of it. Well, did you ever stop at one point and just shake your head and think, 
how on earth did I get here? Because, you know, um, I, I think that every day. Well, well, you know, because in a way, you sort of remind me of Bill Hicks and his story. You remember who Bill Hicks was? I know the name. If you well, remind Bill me, Hicks, Bill Go Hicks ahead. was by far as good or better than Robin Williams or Jonathan Winters. Oh, yes, Williams. I know who you're talking about. Yes. Okay. He never got the stardom he deserved in America. He became a rock star in England yes. the same way you became a rock star in England and Europe. So we're going to put that on pause for a minute. That's fine. So we'll, okay. okay, because I, I must tell you, as somebody who has been on the fringes of show business for over 60 years, often on the fringes in a couple of years. Can I just um, stop you for one second? Sure. I think... It is, I, I, I am still going to where you said you got deported twice. It took you third to become a citizen. And I'm sorry, but I've got to say this. And they're allowing over a million people to cross that southern border just open. Come on in. And they're not deporting. I think it is a crime against humanity. So anyway, go on. Well, I can identify with a lot of them. And the sad thing is that, you know, they didn't just show up when Biden became president. A lot of them are coming from Asia. It took them a year and a half to get here. Oh, so, I know. You know, it's really tough. But in any event, I was going to say that I have, I, uh, you know, I was Sinatra's private writer for four and a half years. And I knew all, all of the, the major, major stars have been we're on my um, on my show, so I've heard countless, countless great show business. That, you you are a legend, and that's why I am here. Oh well, bless your heart. I, I didn't even know that you knew me. But the thing is, I have heard just scores and scores of magnificent show business stories, but not one, not one equals the story of you looking for a job in a parking lot in Los Angeles in the 60s. So please regale me and the rest of us with that again. Okay. So I'm gonna answer the question that you asked me a long time ago. Okay. I, I, did, I did go and I put, after my mother died, my father died, I put myself, I went to, I remember going to the grocery store buying all kinds of food. My grandmother, I had, I had inherited her little black and white TV um, and I took some clothes and I guess I took a pillow or something and some, and I locked myself in this apartment. I do not remember being in there. I do remember the guy that I talk about constantly, Billy Slocum. Yeah. That's who found me and took me out. Why I was there is because my mother died and my father tried to kill me, but what happened in there? I couldn't tell you. So now go, what was your, oh, what was your question? Okay, we're going fast forward a bit because you, you have got to start to be singing publicly. And you must have started with this magnificent sound because you seem to have always had it now and, uh, and people wanted to hear it. What, what prompted you to start doing it publicly? And then what brought you to Los Angeles to look for a job in a parking lot. Okay, we got to go back. We got to go back. Okay. High school, playing football. The second half of the year, you 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 were then assigned two study halls. I had to get out of study hall. <laughs> so the the I could I went to counselor. I got two electives. One was choir, and the other was a theater class, and. I thought theater, okay, I can talk there because I like to talk. And, and choir, I went, I don't, I don't have, that's when I figured out I could sing. I don't have to do anything. And I just went, I just lip, I just moved my mouth. And they told me I was a bass, so I went, okay. And, and after I got hit in the shot put, I was still in the choir and I went back and they asked me to sing one day solo and I went, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And she <laughs> said to me, you're not a bass. And 
we sing some more. And she goes, you're a tenor. Yes, you are. I know. And so now I'm in choir and I'm doing theater class. And when you're in choir, you're, you're, you're required to be in the high school musical. Well, the first one, when I was sophomore, and I just got back in school after getting hit in the head, just in the nick of time, I was in the music man. And it didn't interfere with baseball. So I just was the, one of the salesmen on the train. And then I was gone. And the next year, the same thing. And I was in Where's Charlie? And I had one line. Oh, Ma- wow. Madam, dinner is served. And and I sang a little bit with one song and I was gone again. Well, there you go. See, you remember the one line. Uh, Bob Hope, oh gosh, I hope you go to watch it. Uh, Bob Hope gave up entertaining the troops one Christmas to come and do my show live after I had suggested he retire because he was becoming the Jagger Hoover of humor. He (laughs) he, He became a comic by accident. You know, he was a dancer and a singer. And one day their MC didn't show up. And so the owner and the manager said, hey, Mr. Hope, could you get out there and do a couple of lines? He said, well, I don't know anything. He said, well, we need to kill some time. So now here is Hope. He was all, he was 80 at the time. And he remembered his very first joke. He said, the first joke I said was, uh, he said, uh, I met this old farmer who was getting married and his wife wanted to get married in the church. And he said, no, he wanted to get married in the backyard. And they got married in the backyard because he wanted the chickens to eat the rice. I mean, it was just, a, <laughs> and he remembered everything. About I didn't it. know that joke, but I'm going to use that joke. Thank you. Bob so, Hope is, a, Bob Hope is one of, uh, I've got like maybe four real five that I really look up to. Bob Hope, Jimmy Stewart, Elvis Presley, John Lennon, and the fifth one I had in my brain, and uh, um, uh, uh, Marlon Brando. Well, I must tell you, I admire you for admiring all of these people, and especially John Lennon and uh, Bob Hope. So if you get a chance, if you go to my site and watch the interview, because we're live, and Crosby calls in to talk to Bob. And the interesting thing is that Crosby can remember the first girl on the show, because that's who he liked, and Bob Hope could remember the first commercial. I mean, it's just a great show. So well, anyway. You always re- you, when you're in that situation, you always remember that first thing. You don't remember a lot after that, but the first thing you remember, it's like that first line. That's right. You know why? Because it has an emotional impact on you. And yeah, it's like it the has first an emotional line impact, drop. it sticks to your brain. Okay, now I want to get to the story of you going to Los Angeles. What prompted you to leave Dallas to go to Los Angeles and then on for a job okay. as a parking lot attendant? I went to Los Angeles twice. Remember okay. I told you the story? I I went to home and got my father's credit card. This was before, and this was when my mother was sick and went to Los Angeles. Oh. Well, I stayed there and I, beca- I was, became a bouncer in a teenage oh nightclub. God. And I was living in the back room. And these policemen showed up early in the morning asking for Marvin Lee a day. And people did not know who that was. And the minute they said my name and I looked through the little window, I went, my mother's dead. These kids raised enough money for me to get a ticket to fly home, a a taxi to the airport and food. So these 13, 14, 15 year old kids, 16, did all that for me. And so I went home. That's when my father tried to come in. That's when I went myself up. So I went back to California and I didn't know what I was going to do. And I went and sang at a youth center in Encino, California. 
and I sang one song. And I believe it was, um, oh, I had it. I had um, oh, the Kingsman, Louis Louis. <laughs> and I, I'm not going to swear to that, but that's one of the few songs I knew. And after that, everybody goes, well, you should be in a band. So I had a 16-year-old bass player with me, 17-year-old guitar player. What was I, 18? Um, my mother was 17 when I died, so I was 18. And we went to a recording studio. I was going to sing a song, some, I'm an animal. <laughs> Just, I'm an animal. It's very Elvis-like. And we got a drummer from the guitar store next door named Pete Woodman. I shook his hand. The bass player came in with him. He had no fingers. Oh, gosh. And I said to the I said, he can't play drums. He goes, well, he says he can. And so we did. And we recorded this track. I went to do the vocal. And the engineer had it the, the up too loud. And I blew the fuse, blew oh, the entire God. studio. So that's the story. Milov blew up the studio. Now I blew a fuse. And so then I, I was in the business a month. I got three record offers from Green and Stone, who produced the Buffalo Springfield, from the owner of that studio, and from some guy at AM Records. Well, listen, if you got an offer from AM Records, I why turned it all down. down. I turned it down. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first, why did you turn it down? Uh, because you had a chance to sing with AM Records. And why did you go looking for a job in a parking lot? Okay. So I turned it down. Because I went to somebody's house who was a good businessman and talked it over with him. And he said, do you know anything about this business? I went, no. He said, there's your answer. <laughs> so I, and so then we, we, this band, we opened for like them, who was Van Morrison, Gloria, a different band, Janice, different things. Went to Michigan and opened to every band you can think of except the Jefferson Airplane, the Beatles, or the Rolling Stones. Wow. And then we just had enough, and I went back to California, and I didn't have any place to live again, but I knew this guy who, and he was parked cars at the Aquarius parking lot. <laughs> I goes, know where the Aquarius is, sunset and by. That's right. He said, the guy I'm working with is leaving, so come with me, and we'll, you'll get a job parking cars. And they were making between 250 and over $300 a week parking cars, wow. which in 1969 was an absolute fortune. <laughs> $10 was a fortune. And we're standing there waiting for the guy that ran the parking lot to show up. A guy by the name of Greg Carlos walks up and Barney goes, this is my friend Meatloaf. I mean, there's more conversation, but I remember that. This is my friend Meatloaf. And Greg paused for a second, looks at me and goes, do you sing? And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, why aren't you auditioning? And the line, you know, you know the Aquarius. Yes. Okay. It started at the entrance of the parking lot, went all the way around the building. And I looked at him and said, and I probably weighed 280 pounds. I said, I wouldn't stand in line for food that long. <laughs> I remember the line, this is all like, this is so vivid in my head, it's ridiculous. I walk in, I, he sits me down in the back. There's a guy on a big pillow named Armand Coulet, which became my mentor in New York that helped me every time I got another job and I worked constantly, never was out of work. And, um, and I got up on stage eventually, and Armand laying on this, it's hippie time, laying on this big pillow. He goes, hi, what's your name? I go, Meatloaf. He goes, he goes, really? I said, yeah. And he goes, well, what would you bring to sing? And I said, nothing. I came to get a job in the parking lot. <laughs> he said, well, do you want to sing? I went, yes. Now, I had been in a band for a year, but my musical knowledge was still nil. And... I had learned a song from an African-American gospel singer about three weeks before 
And we've been to her house three or four times, a guy named Fred Barnwell, who was a bass, a brilliant singer. And she taught us a song called The World Is All Right. It's the people that make it bad. Oh. And she said to me, you do it in the key of C. It's a blues, but no turnaround. I went, okay, key of C, no turnaround. So I turned to the piano player. I said to him, in the key of C, blues progression, key of C, no turnaround. I started singing. I had no idea what any of this meant. I started <laughs> singing. The world is all right. I got out. The world is all right. It's people that make it bad. The world is all right. It's the people that make it bad. The world is all. Stop. Question. What are you doing tonight? Well, I hope to get a job in a parking lot. <laughs> and he said, well, what if I offer you a job in this musical? You ready for this? My next question was, well, how much does it pay? And he went, I'm not, I, th I think maybe $187 a week. And I said to him, I can make more in the parking lot. And he said, well, what would you rather do? Park cars or be in a musical, a professional musical? And I thought for a second, I went, I'd done the musicals in high school. I'd been in acting class, been in choir. I said, okay, you're right, the musical. And, and then you got to remember, I was in the Detroit area. The guy who was leaving the musical, who I was going to replace, never left. They paid me for six weeks sitting there, oh. doing, watching the show, $187 a week, which was fine. And then he came to me and he said, have you ever been to Detroit? I said, I just left Detroit. He goes, well, I, I would like for you to go back. I said, "New what? Hair. I'm going to direct it. I said, okay. And he said, do you know singers? I said, I know every singer. He goes, great. You can come and help me cast it. And that's what I did. And I got a girl named Sean Murphy, who went by the name of Stoney. Into yes. the musical. She played the name. She played the lead character, Sheila. I sing Aquarius. I was... And when he said 187, what a song. oh my said, gosh, he said, you can make extra by doing extra things in the musical, $17 and 50 cents a week for everything extra. Well, I sing Aquarius, what a piece of work is man, did the moms, young recruit, general grant, everything. Eventually that went to Detroit, signed with Motown. And before we even finished recording, they moved me to Broadway and they moved Stoney with me. Oh my God. And she, as they say, me, the rest is history. And I mean, it's a monumental history. And you and I are going to continue this conversation another day because we have just barely touched it. I mean, I mentioned to you that I was impressed by you in the Rocky Horror Picture. Well, uh, yeah, I'm so, I'm so, you got to end. Oh, God, we haven't even begun. Oh, yeah, I know we haven't begun, but it's only sadly in our show, and I've never lied to anybody. When I sit, listen, I saved the movie, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, which Warner Brothers was trying to trash, and Marty Scorsese thanked me publicly. So I never lie to people. And you, your version of the national anthem is, as I said at the top of the show, and I, I had the opportunity, Martin Scorsese had cast me in a movie and they would not let me, let me leave the play I was in. Oh my gosh, because I must tell you, you have a presence on screen that struck me a little bit like Walter Matthau. Uh, you have a very- Oh lovely... my God, he, I forgot Walt. He is like, oh my God. Tell you the truth, yes, Brando because of his ability as an actor, but Jimmy Stewart and Walter Matthau are the two best screen actors, and along with Clark Gable. Well, and, I would have I would have to put Cary Grant as by far. Okay, Cary Grant, Grant you're okay. not. Yes, I agree with you. Okay, so, so but listen to me. Listen to me. <laughs> Walter I, Matthau, that news bears. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah, uh, because. Sinatra and Dean Martin. Sinatra had a really nice voice. Dean had an ordinary saloon singer's voice, but the appealing person. 
they are as famous for being actors as they are singers. You could have been as famous on screen as Francis and Dean and weren't, but we're not going to get to that right now because you're going to come back and we're going to do another hour and 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 maybe. Two. I never listen. I I've been a fan, and when the minute they sent me the email, they've asked you to do an interview with him. I said yes. I wrote. The, my, my reply was, yes, 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 oh. yes. Oh, my gosh. Bless your heart, you know, because I, I listen, I am, I, I, I am one of the dwarfs in the Wizard of Oz compared to your Judy Garland, okay? But I am so thrilled because I love talking movies. We barely touch the surface of that. We haven't Plus, even started. Uh, yeah, uh, we have, well, we're gonna, you're going to come back. Here. We Listen, got to the year 1970. Okay, we're going to come back and we're going to start in 1970 because I insist that the audience cannot believe it. Those who have not heard and seen you sing the national anthem, no one, not even Ray Charles, comes close. And then you're going to, it's going to be followed by Frank Sinatra singing "The House I Live In." So that's how we're going to close your show. I, you know, I, I've said this to a couple of people I've been interviewed. If I was religious, I'd say, bless your heart. But already you've been blessed. Okay, so one more real quick story, okay? Okay. I had a meeting with Bill Paley, and no one had been in his office since Lucille Ball. President of CBS, you have to add yes, that. Yes, in his office since Lucille Ball signed her television contract for I Love Lucy. I spent 45 minutes with Bill Paley. No one that they could, they were in shock. And Bill Paley told me how he found Sinatra. And I want to tell you that story. Okay, well, listen, I'm going to tell you a story when we re-meet. It's in my book, Your Mother's Not a Virgin, The Bumpy Life and Times of the Canadian Dropout Who Changed I've got to, I got to get, I've got to get your book. I didn't know you had a book. I'm going to get your book. Well, listen, I don't want you to buy it. I want to autograph it to you. I'll send the book, Federal Express. Well, mine's not that long and it's got big print and it's easy to read. (laughs) Okay. I need big print. Okay. Thank you so much again. You're welcome. Okay. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Love you, man. Oh, thank you.
is America to me. A house I live in, a plot of earth, a street, a grocer and a butcher, and the people that I meet, the children in the playground, the faces that I see, all races and religions, that's America to me. The place I work in, the worker at my side, the little town or city, where my people lived and died, the howdy and the handshake, the air of feeling free, and the right to speak my mind out, that's America to me. The things I see about me, the big things and the small, the little corner newsstand and the house a mile tall, the wedding and the churchyard, the laughter and the tears, the dream that's been a growing for a hundred and fifty years. The town I live in, the street. The house, the room, the pavement of the city, or a garden all in bloom, the church, the school, the clubhouse, the million lights I see, but especially the people. That is amazing American talent to me. And in two weeks, another magnificent talent, a great, great actress who's appeared in 250 films, a great writer with a number of best-selling books, and one of the most sought-after public speakers on the entire planet. It is the magnificent and delightful D. Wallace in two weeks on Talking Movies.